All right, everyone. So we are recording. So as we just said, uh, Alex is going to first look at, I think Amelia may have sent us some code. We're going to look through some of that for maybe five minutes, and then I will pick up with the human computer interaction piece for today. OK. So I did receive a code from, oh, gosh. I've got logged out from my uh, from my Google account, so I'll have to log back in. Hang on a second. Obviously, not the one that I'm using for for the call, but the one that I'm using for my email. And I'm not able to log in again. OK, so Anaya sent uh, a nice HTML file, which I have oh, yeah, promptly okay. which I have promptly loaded onto a uh, brand new website, the website for our class. So if anybody wants to send me um, HTML, CSS images, whatever you guys want to publish, prior careful editorial review by our you know editorial review board, I will publish it for you on an S3 website. And I'm, I'm not sharing my screen, am I? No, not yet. OK, so let me present. And here it is. Can you guys see it? Can you guys see the, the web page, the nice web page? Yeah. This is awesome. So. Uh, we even have images of Anaya's dog. Let's look at so, some code. What's that? Let's look at the code. Let's look at the code. That's right. So view page source. There, there we go. So we start out with an H1 followed by span. Uh, this is not correct HTML. You know, like I showed yesterday, HTML should start with a doc type declaration that defines the file as, a, as an HTML file, and then an open HTML tag followed by an open body, followed by the content, followed by closed body, followed by closed HTML. We don't have all of that here, but Chrome is smart enough to you know, do something sensible, and it's showing us the content anyway. Okay, But notice that there is no title up here. It doesn't show us the title of an IS web page. Uh, at the top of the tab. It just shows us the URL. If this were a properly formatted HTML with a open HTML, open head, in other words, the header, open title, title, close title, close head, open body, content, close body, close HTML, we would have the title of the page here. And just for comparison, just to show off how good of an HTML programmer I am, this is my website, it's a brave new website, all written by hand. And as you can see up here at the top of the tab, it says a brave new website because that's the title tab or the, the title um, node in this HTML document. Here we have the doc type declaration, doc type HTML followed by open HTML, open head, open title, the text of the title, close title, and then close head. And now we're ready to open the body. This is all the content. Then we have close body, close HTML. Do we have an eye on the call? Yes. All right. Why don't you tell us something about your, your website and how you got your idea? And where did you read the documentation to find instructions on how to use all these fancy tags that I was showing earlier? Let's go back to the source code of your page. Um, my dad, he works in IT. Uh -huh. And he was helping me with that. OK. That's how I got the, and my, I guess, inspiration was my dog, because I guess he's the, he was the most easiest thing to do, like for like, I don't know. My dog, he's just, I did my dog because 
he's, he's very fluffy and very pretty. Yeah. So that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Here's another question for you. Did you actually write this by hand or did you use a tool like a word we processor? We used a tool. tool. Okay. You know how I know? Why? Because this is very verbose code. You are adding a caller to the H1 tag, but then you are immediately replacing the caller inside the span tag. Okay, and then you're adding another caller here. And then you're adding another caller here. We used okay. an online HTML generator. Yeah. So this is the type of code that you would expect an HTML generator to write. Why? Because machines are very patient. They don't mind being very repetitive. They don't get bored. Humans, on the other hand, get bored. They don't want to write the same thing many times, like style float left, style float left, style float left. You wouldn't do that, right? You would use a CSS style sheet to tell the browser every time you see an IMG tag, let it be known to you that I want the style to be float left. Okay, and so, so there's a question about uh, what is N percent NBSP. Okay, so uh, these are combinations of ASCII letters that represent a non ASCII symbol. As you remember, maybe hopefully from a few days ago, um, I think it was Sanjay who explained the ASCII character set. It's an ancient and very venerable set of 127 characters. And with 127 characters in the English language, you can pretty much get by. You get, you get all the uppercase letters, all the lowercase letters, all the numbers, plenty of punctuation, you know, commas, periods, semicolons, colons, uh, apostrophes, double quotes. But once you start, um, Rep once you start to attempt to represent all sorts of other types of characters, like other languages, like all the accents that are present in languages derived from Latin, and then all languages that are not derived from Latin use a completely different alphabet. And then once you start adding to that uh, all sorts of fancy graphical symbols, like you know mm, emojis, then the number of characters that you need to represent is vastly greater than 127. And so you need a larger character set. That character set is called Unicode. And there are various ways to represent a Unicode character. One way to represent Unicode is in HTML. It's true only in HTML or you know, in HTML and a few other languages, but not necessarily everywhere, is to use um, a, com a special combination of characters, a special combination of regular ASCII characters that tells the browser, wait a minute, this is not going to be a regular ASCII character. This is, hang on, this is the name of the Unicode character that I want you to use. And I'm done telling you about this Unicode character. Okay, so ampersand means I'm about to tell you what Unicode character I want then there's the name of the character. NBSP stands for non-breaking space. It's a completely white character. There's, it doesn't show anything on the screen, um, but it's, it's a real character. Like it's a, it's a letter that does not have any symbol. And because it's a letter, it keeps a word, it keeps the left word and the right word together. They're not different words. They form a single word, even though there's a space in between. And then we have the semicolon, which means I'm done telling you about this non-ASCII character, okay? So um, Anaya's file is ending with a paragraph, okay? Paragraph, which contains a special non-breaking space, then it contains a regular space, then a special non-breaking space, then a regular space, then a non-breaking space, then a regular space, all the way to the end of the paragraph. And then it contains yet another paragraph, that contains only a non-breaking space. And then that's the end of the paragraph, okay? Again, this type of style shows clearly that she is using an automated tool that is producing a lot of needless HTML, right? A lot of HTML that doesn't really do anything for us. All of this white space, it's just white, right? It's, it's a white, set of spaces on a white screen 
you can imagine that it's not going to do a whole lot. All right, cool. Let's see if so we can find that, that white space yeah. somewhere. Here it is. See that yeah, I yeah. have selected? Yeah, yeah. OK, I'm trying to select text. And I'm selecting white stuff, right? which is becoming slightly bluish as I'm selecting it. This white stuff at the bottom of the page is all that non-breaking spaces, all those non-breaking spaces, and the, also the breaking spaces, regular spaces, that Anaya added at the very end of her file. Isn't that cool? OK, one more question for Anaya, and then I'll uh, hand the conversation to, to Sanjay. I have one more question for you. Um, you are referencing an image repeatedly in your file. This image is sourced from an address that's outside of my website. It's https colon slash slash cdn3 dash www.dogtime.com, assets, and so on. Is this an image that you found on the internet and that you reused, uh, that you basically linked from its source website? Or did you upload this image to um, dogtime.com? We Googled it. OK. Um, we, yeah. So I want to make a point that um, you need to be aware of copyright laws. You are referencing a picture in your website uh, that belongs to somebody else. We don't know who it belongs to, but you know whoever uploaded this picture to dogtime.com, presumably the owners of dogtime.com, owns the copyright to this picture. So in general, we are not allowed to publish somebody else's images or somebody else's text or somebody else's content without their permission. OK, this is part of the general idea of you know plagiarism. You're not supposed to plagiarize other people's material. In this case, uh, we are probably plagiarizing somebody else's uh, whatever dog, Bichon Frise, or whatever, whatever the name of the dog is. So that's something that you need to be aware of and pay attention to when you decide to publish a website. We are probably not going to get sued by dogtime.com. Uh, but if you do it often enough, and if you do enough of this, somebody sooner or later will, you know, will have their lawyers send you a nasty gram. Okay, thank in, you. In, in fact, for this reason, I contacted the the teacher or the professor who taught this class at Stanford and asked her for her permission to use her slides, because we were planning to record this, we were planning to put it on YouTube, and uh, you know, if she ever found out, she would be like, "Hey, what the heck? You know, I I didn't tell these guys they could use my stuff," and so I thought best to ask. And so I have that, and it's clear, and now it's all fine. It's great. Okay, so with that, let me uh, first of all uh, uh, introduce you to someone who's helping us with the class tonight. So, one of my colleagues from work, his name is Charles Berg. He's uh, the guy over there with that amazing beard. Uh, so, so Charles is going to uh, walk us through some things. Uh, he is, uh, I will embarrass him a little bit, an expert in human computer interaction, user experience design. Uh, he works very closely with me every day, poor guy. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, we, we, we do well. And he very kindly agreed when I asked him last night if, if he would teach the class today. So I'm going to very quickly like probably spend like maybe five to seven minutes going over some basic stuff. Um, and then I'm going to turn it over to Charles. So uh, let me start presenting my screen. I took a look at the slides that uh, Ms. Taylor had, had put together for this session. And while most of her slides and most of her materials have been pretty good, I'm sure we'd, we'd agree, you know, maybe if Alex and I were designing this from the ground up, we may have made some changes. Sometimes the sequencing of things was not exactly the way we liked it. But for the most part, it was pretty good. For whatever reason, this section was remarkably light on content. And maybe it was because perhaps she brought a guest lecturer in when she taught this class. Uh, or maybe uh, she had tons of great stories or other props or other uh, you know visual aids to show off while she was teaching this. Uh, I could not find them in the slides, and so I felt like it was really hard for us to uh, to teach this without bringing in someone who who actually knows this space really well. So I want to talk about very quickly. I mean, recall that we've learned about code, HTML, you know, style sheets, JavaScript. These are all ways of generating code to do something 
uh, for us, right? The code processes information. Uh, it ultimately presents us with some information that we want to interact with, right? However, uh, you remember when I wrote that that very simple code and we, we had that prompt command, which popped up a little box, which we entered the numbers three and four into, right? That was me interacting with the computer at that point. Or in fact, indeed, the way you logged into this, this video call today, uh, clicked on the link, you know, kind of said, yeah, I want to join. And then Alex on his side had to admit you to the call. These are all methods of humans and computers interacting. And this is very critical, right? Because if we get that wrong, it can lead to some very um, interesting interactions, shall we say. OK, so that's the idea behind HCI. With that, I want to just walk you through some very quick, um, interesting slides here. So I found these on LinkedIn. Uh, you can see here that whoever designed this this pathway, they uh, you know they designed it to go straight, kind of this way, and then take a left turn very neatly, very nicely. But obviously, there's a whole bunch of people who want to take this left turn, right? So at some point, they just start walking across the grass, and in time, people start to notice that hey, you know what? This path of grass is in fact worn down. So yeah, maybe that's the right path after all, right? So the design was intended to go straight and left. These people start walking diagonally over time. You know, they they learn some, they they, they have some some visual cue that tells them what to do here, right? Which nobody really intended, but you know, as they say, nature will find a way, or people might find a way around uh, something that was difficult. Um, you guys may look on the top of your browser. You may see you know, a toolbar on the top. The purpose of a toolbar is to give you shortcuts to find things easily or things that you can, you might want to use frequently, right? But look at what happens when you install too many toolbars. This is probably uh, an example from maybe 10 years ago when toolbars were really popular. And pretty much every website or every, um, you know, um, yeah, pretty much every website or company you interacted with on the web wanted to throw a toolbar at you. Oh, we should have a toolbar because it'll make things easy for our users. Well, guess what? If your users use, you know, 15 different services, then their screen start looking like this. And oh, wow, like, is this helpful now or not? Like, it's a, it's, it seems like a mess, right? Okay, you may notice that if you see a typical Apple product, and again, this is just super generalizing, right? Uh, you you pull it up, you you look at it. It's like very few buttons. Uh, they, they're really, really, really thinking about, hey, how can we make things as simple as possible? How do we create this combination of hardware and software? In fact, indeed, perhaps even art to to help make these things look really beautiful and elegant and above all intuitive. So think about this word intuitive, and Charles will come back to it later. A Google product, even till today, our website is pretty simple. Uh, believe me, we we're always tempted to put more more junk on it uh, because oh, wouldn't it be easy? But then there's so much fear of ultimately that could become a toolbar type situation. Uh, your company's app not meant to necessarily you know insult or disparage anybody, but if you're not careful, this can so very easily happen when you design a website, an app, or a service. Okay, uh, I'm gonna skip this one. I don't. Uh, it's really not important. Okay, this is interesting. Now, your call is so important to us when you call a company like a phone company that we're gonna keep you <laughs> listening to a flute solo for 40 minutes, right? So what is your user experience when you call a company? You're like, I called to speak to someone because I have a problem. Instead, I got to hear this 40 minute annoying flute solo. Uh, it's not even great a great flute solo, which actually could be fun, right? Um, this one is, uh, is interesting. Customers who bought this item also bought this. This is like some cross-selling kind of thing. Uh, trying to get you to do something that you may not necessarily want, and the only thing you have is like one set of bananas. Like, what is what going is on here? Very, very, very confusing, right? Uh, Wait, what's okay. the RFL? Oh, roll over the floor, laughing. It's a, uh, it's a, uh -huh. it's a boomer uh -huh. acronym. Not, not uh, for you. RFL. Okay. Now, now this one is uh, where someone's trying to go on vacation to Hawaii. So they go to a web page, they type in Honolulu, right? We say it Honolulu, we don't say Honolulu, right? So it's quite reasonable we might type in Honolulu unless you've been there before or you actually know how to spell it. You may type in Honolulu, which is also fine, or you may type in Hawaii, which is the wrong spelling, but it sounds right. And no, no matter what this poor man types in, you know, they already have their Hawaiian shirts and you know, their cool shorts and whatnot, and, and they just can't find what they're looking for because the user is trying, you know, you know, if the user is trying something or if enough users are trying something, uh, 
it should be fine. Like, why, why do why don't we adapt the computer to do the right thing versus the user now has to just go see their their you know parents in North Dakota, or wherever Fargo is, right? <laughs> so, um, yeah, a user interface is like a joke. If you have to explain it, it's not that good, right? So, a joke should be something where you hear the joke, you both start laughing. It's funny. It's great. Okay. Uh, this is um you know it, the UX design was impl in, implemented exactly as intended. Yeah, if you're not careful, you can really mess this stuff up. Uh, okay, this is these are some some jokes. I'll go through them quickly. Uh, you you you're trying to hire somebody who claims to know something about this field about how to design uh, human computer interactions that are elegant, and and they tell you that uh, you say so. So what's your experience in this area? And they say I made wireframes. Wireframes are a way of Kind of drawing a very elementary, a rudimentary sketch, uh, and, and they and they tell you that all they've done is wireframes. You're like, okay, you know, anybody can do wireframes. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're a great UX designer. Uh, I've designed an app in the App Store. Well, how wonderful! Just because your app is in the App Store doesn't mean it's good. Okay, anybody can put an app in the App Store, so that doesn't really mean anything. Uh, the next one is my process is my own. Uh, okay, you're you're not really going through a set of known established steps, which I won't steal Charles's thunder, but there are some really good ways of doing this actually to understand uh, how to build these sorts of elegant user interfaces. So someone who tells you their process is their own, they might be really good, but the chances are they really have no idea what they're doing. Um, we learn when it's live. Okay, this is great. This is like. Hey, uh, I'm I'm not really gonna think about it. I'm gonna throw something out there. I'm gonna design this thing or quote unquote design it, and then as people use it and they kind of trip up all over themselves and they start struggling, that's when we get feedback and we learn. Well, you're gonna have a lot of very unhappy people if you haven't really thought through what it is that they're trying to do. And then the last thing is like, I'm a creative person. I'm not a technical one. I mean, what what in the world does that mean? If you're designing technical products, you better be competent in creativity, in you know thinking about the problem, and also being able to advise engineers. Or in many cases, many of our UX people are very technical. They actually understand. They have minors or majors in computer science, and you know a couple of minors or majors in many other fields, which are really really interesting. Uh, once the product is built, I'm ready to move on. So people don't think about how they can improve a product. They they aren't interested in feedback. You know that maybe that's probably not a good thing either. OK, so now let's walk through some things, right? Someone gives you this. this they put tea into one of these uh, plastic canisters and says, enjoy it. Well, how are you ever supposed to pour something out of that, right? Who knows? Um, let's like Please have lunch with us. Notice the chain link over there. There's just no way to pick up this fork, right? What were they thinking? It looks really nice, but it doesn't really suit the purpose. Uh, this one is interesting. Like, How do you sit on this, right? Or, or how do you how do you sit any? I mean, you're not even going to fit on this thing, right? And then the last thing is like a dinner set. And these are all intended to be, you know, uh, a, a little funny. So you can see here many examples of stuff that's just not thought through, really. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Charles. I'm going to let him uh, introduce himself real quick. And once again, Charles, thank you. Uh, thank you, Sanjay, and uh, thanks, Sanjay and Alex, for for having me. I'm very happy to to be here and talk a little bit about that. And I really appreciate the uh, examples um, that you showed, Sanjay. They uh, really show an idea of what uh, someone thinks when they think of uh, users, maybe, or people without really asking those people or really informing or including those people. And really, what UX design is all about is trying to keep the the uh, users into the the users who are going to use the tool or whatever you're making into the process. Uh, so with that, I'm going to present my stuff, and um, and we'll get going here. So let's see here. Ah, yeah. Okay. Hopefully, we you can see my uh, screen. Yep. Thank um, you. Awesome. No problem. Uh, so basically, what I'm going to talk about today is. Um, oh, I'm sorry. But I apologize. Before I start, I just want to introduce myself a little bit more. Um, my name is Charles Charles Berg. My um, email address is at the end 
of this presentation in case you have any questions or anything you want to talk about. Uh, I'm happy to, happy to entertain any sort of UX or design questions you may have, uh, not only in this call, but also uh, afterwards. And um, I'm a designer at Google, uh, UX designer at Google. I've uh, been there for three, three, four years, a little under four years now, three years. Uh, before that, I worked at Skype and Motorola, uh, the cell phone manufacturers. I've worked a number of places before. As you can tell by my, my gray beard, I've been around a little bit. And I've uh, not only worked on traditional uh, user interfaces, such as screens, uh, which I do a lot, or, or, um, or app screens, but I've also worked on the uh, Google Home product, which is a speaker-only device, and other things. Uh, the uh, Google, the excuse me, the Nest Hub, uh, which is a screen-based, a fixed screen. So I've actually um, experienced <laughs> some user experience or or design in uh, things that aren't just traditionally the screens. Uh, so with that, I'll talk about what we're going to talk about here. Um, so. More or less, I'm going to give you an overview of uh, human-computer action interaction, a little brief, a very brief uh, history of what it's all about, and um, then talk about what good design is, how it's um, how it's constructed, and then what the process is. Uh, after we talk a little bit about the process. I'll talk about some of the tools that people use to design stuff in the digital world, as well as um, just a brief discussion about non-traditional interfaces, which is the non-screen stuff. So basically, first, the first thing we need to talk about is just the terminology. So um, human-computer action is more or less the study of user experience, otherwise known as UX. And, um, and also UI, which is part of, of UX, which means user interface. Um, HCI started in the 70s, um, and it was really based on trying to make uh, these, at the time, newfangled uh, computers, or at least smaller computers, trying to make them uh, more understandable by humans. Previous to the 60s, Especially a lot of computers, you need to have a degree to really run them, figure them out, uh, even for the most basic tasks. And uh, in the 70s and beyond, that started expanding to people who maybe didn't need the degree. And uh, with that came this idea that maybe we need to create interfaces that are understandable by these, by these people who haven't been trained just solely on computers. And so HCI started in universities across um, America and the world. Um, what basically what sprang out of uh, human computer inter interaction or HCI is um, user experience. And user experience really is a complete user experience, not just what someone sees on the screen or what how someone interacts with the technology, but sometimes what happens before they interact with that technology or even after what happens with the technology. I gave the little um, example of a wine bottle being poured into a wine glass just to say that it's not just the wine that's what is the user experience. The user experience starts with buying the bottle, opening the bottle, pouring the wine, et cetera, et cetera. That's the whole user experience of which the user interface is only one component of that. And so that's what my last uh, square in the slide just talks about, which is um, essentially the user interface, which is the um, what someone sees on the screen. Excuse me, just one second. I'm going to close my door because I can hear myself, and uh, then I'll continue on. Yeah. All right, much better. So there's one in today, at least today, there's one person who kind of hangs over the concept of HCI and the concept of UX. His name is Don Norman, this guy on the left. Um, he, was a, uh, he was trained in psychology in the 1960s, and he worked for many years at San Diego State University. And he was uh, one of the first, first people in the, in the uh, late 20th century, I guess, to um, start writing down the rules of human computer action, user experience, and uh, UI, and he created a, he wrote a book in the late 80s called The Design of Everyday Things. 
uh, which I, I offer a link to. And it's a book that you should read. And it talks about user interfaces outside of technology itself, user interfaces of stoves, user interfaces of cars and buses, as well as, as other things that aren't um, digital. And the reason that he focused on these kind of things is because he wanted to make the point that a user interface doesn't have to be just a screen or a bunch of pixels or whatever. It actually, a user interface is, is more or less anything. And when he started focusing on these um, non-digital user interfaces, he started compiling a number of rules that uh, people should follow when they're designing interfaces. And he got famous for one of those rules. He has a number of different rules, but one of them uh, was uh, famous, which is uh, the picture on the right, which is uh, an example of what is called a Norman door, um, named after Don Norman. Unfortunately, he probably isn't too happy about this. Um, but basically, his point was that even something as simple as a door can have a user interface. And uh, most people's uh, idea of a user interface for a door is very simple. Like there's probably in, wherever you are, an apartment, a house, or wherever you have a door, and there's a door knob. And that knob is an interface to say, hey, this is how you open the door. Even before you get to the knob, you're already, there's, this, this goes by very quickly because we've seen doorknobs all our lives, but um, your brain is thinking, oh, I now know the cue or the clue on how to open this door. It's this doorknob, amazing. But there's a lot of buildings out there done in a, written in a certain, or excuse me, built in a certain style um, where people started making doors that maybe don't have a doorknob on them or a door handle or anything like that, which is fine. That's a nice little design thing. It makes things very sleek. But the problem is, is that when you don't have a doorknob or any sort of cue towards how the door works, people sometimes get confused and they start pushing when they should be pulling the door open um, and, they, and embarrassing things happen. And so uh, the idea of a Norman door is a door that has a bad user interface, one in which when you go to the door before you interact with it, it's not very evident exactly what you do to that door. Do you push it? Do you pull it? What do you, what do you exactly do you do? And so a Norman door is an example of a bad user interface for something as simple as a door. Dan Norman just incidentally, he's, um, he's active today. He has created a uh, company with, or a consultant company with uh, uh, another one of his colleagues, um, Nielsen. It's called the Norman Nielsen Group. And they actually do user interface consulting uh, they do classes, one-day classes, five-day classes, all sorts of things. Um, and so you can actually uh, get more of these rules and information from his website, uh, their website, as well as um, you could attend one of, the, attend one of their uh, roaming workshops. So that's just a little brief um, history and information about what human-computer interaction is, uh, what user experience is, um, or at least the concept of it, as well as user interface. And so now we're going to go into the details of what makes a good design, how that is really a uh, judge. So, excuse me. Oh, okay. Um, so basically, the th four criteria or um, areas in which you can think of a good design are as follows. Is something useful? Is a design or an interface useful? Is it usable? Does the design or interface add value to the product or whatever you're trying to design? And by the way, I just want to stop and say I use the word product um, very loosely. It doesn't have to be a product like something that is being sold. It's just something that people are going to use is, is my definition of a product. Um, and then also, finally, um, does the design enhance the brand? And again, brand doesn't necessarily have to mean like the brand of something that you buy and sell, but a brand is just the idea of what the product is. And what by, I mean by that, if I can go uh, back to the front, back to the first one, is it, when you think of good design being useful, is, a product, is this product useful to me? Now, not all of that is dependent on the design, but a good part of it is. If you think of something as simple as an alarm clock, 
you bought the product because you wanted to know probably two things. Number one, what time it was. And number two, you wanted a tool to help you wake up in the morning. So the product might be, might be very useful to you or may be very meaningful to you, but the design is really what makes it, makes it sing. If you had an alarm clock with a design where all the, all the buttons and the knobs were recessed or sunken into the clock itself, even though it is an alarm clock and it's a product that uh, can technically do what you want it to do, the design is so poor because you can't reach the little knobs to adjust the time or the alarm. Um, the design is so poor that it, re it actually goes the opposite of a useful product. It renders the product useless. And design really should enhance the usefulness of a product. In the case of an alarm clock, the knobs are um, behind the clock, <laughs> you know, so you can see the time, and that they're kind of sticking out so that you can wind them or turn them or whatever you need to do. Um, if a product is usable, I just also not only did I describe useful, but I described usable with my alarm clock example as well, um, that if you buy a simple alarm clock and there is uh, 16 knobs uh, at behind to set the alarm, that's not necessarily very usable. In fact, it would be the opposite, it would be very confusing. But a usable product is one that is, makes the functionality of the product, it really just narrows it down to the lowest amount of steps that you need to do to, um, to complete the task. So in the case of the alarm clock where you have to set an alarm, you want to have one or two at the most knobs or buttons to do this. If you had more, um, it doesn't really become very usable anymore. The next thing is that design does is um, it can add value to the product itself. A lot of design choices kind of run um, in between the idea of usefulness as well as the idea of something that's pleasing to look at, look at or interesting to look at. Um, back to my alarm clock example, there are many alarm clocks out there. Some can have white numbers against a black background, some have black numbers against a white background. Those are design choices that not only are, um, represent the usability of a product, but also represent the um, enjoyment of it. Some people like black or dark things, so that design enhances the usefulness and the usability by just simply making what we call an aesthetic or visual choice. And then finally, um, another fundamental of good design is that it enhances the brand of the product. So a lot of people, a lot of things, a lot of organizations make more than one product, and the sum total of those products is really considered their brand. And so in the case of my alarm clock, if you had a company or a group of people, say just let's call them Smith Company, and they're making a number of different products, in one product, the design of it, the usefulness, the added value of it may reflect on other products that that uh, organization makes, the Smith Company in this case. And that's a, an example of how the design of one thing can enhance or detract the usability or the enjoyment or the value of everything that this organization makes. So how do we do this? Um, today's viewpoint of good design really revolves around users, potential users who will use the thing that you are making. Again, I just want to represent one more time, or I just want to repeat one more time. When I talk about product, I don't necessarily mean something that you have to go to the store and buy, but it could be whatever you are making. But these days, when we think of good design, we think of a process in which you put, you ask the users more or less before you make the product, you ask the users or you observe the users um, doing what they're doing, and then you ask yourself, how can, can whatever I want to make solve the problems of the users itself? And more specifically, the way this works is what's called a user-centered um, design process which more or less has five steps. If you type in user-centered design process into Google, and you search it, you might find uh, people talking about a user-centered design process that has six steps or maybe even four steps. But really, they're just 
mashing steps together or, or spreading them out a bit. The good, good user design process has these five major steps. And they are discover, define, design, validate, and then finally develop or build. And simply what that means is that, uh, as I talked about, a user design process starts with asking or observing the users doing what they're doing in the area that you want to build in and see if you can help them, trying to figure out how you can help them with whatever you're making. So that's the discover phase, where you observe or you ask. Once you've observed, say, uh, people doing things that maybe are suboptimal or not always the best, um, you go into what is called the define phase, where you basically more or less um, ask yourself, well, how would I think of this, pro this future product, this thing that I'm going to make, how would I think of this as a su successful product? You, call, you create what are called design metrics so that you know whatever you're making, you can have a, a benchmark to measure against. That's called the define process. The design process is the nitty gritty, which is where you start creating ideas about how to solve user problems in the area that you're interested in. You start writing these down, you start drawing them, you start brainstorming, you go through a number of different iterations, changes or shifts to uh, try and figure out the exact right precise way to help the user in whatever you're trying to help them with. The validation is where you take the best ideas that you've made and you bring them back to the user them, um, himself or herself, and you more or less show them to see if it's um, if actually what your ideas, if your ideas are good, or if there's some ways that you need to refine them. A lot of people in a good design process will get kind of I don't want to call it caught, but they will get. Um, pushed between the design phase and the validation phase a couple times because they'll, they'll observe people doing something and they'll be like, hey, I can think of a product to make them do it better. So let's just say you, um, you are observing people scratching their back and you realize that you know, their arms are too short, that's the problem right there, to get all the way down the back. And that's the problem. So you, that's your discovery and your define in your define phase, you start saying, well, um, if someone can get satisfied while they scratch their back all the way from bottom to top, well, that's a good product. So that's what I'm going to make, something that, you can, that can get the scratcher, can scratch the back from, from bottom to top. When you get into the design phase, however, you start playing around with the idea. It's like, OK, how can I scratch a back? Well, I could take a comb and duct tape it to like a broom handle. Maybe that would work. Or maybe I could take a rake and just, you know, someone could just buy a rake at a hardware store. And they could also it could double as a back scratcher. And so you have all these ideas. And after you talk it through, you work with people, maybe you just discuss it out, or maybe you create some sort of what we call prototypes, some sort of experimental versions, you come up with this idea where you're like, yeah, I think a comb on a broom handle, that's going to work great. So at that point, you are more or less exiting the design phase. You move into the validation phase, where you go find some users and you test it out, more or less. So you take duct tape and you tape a comb around the bottom of your broom handle. And you go find some people and you say, hey, go scratch your back. And you just observe, again, like you would in the discover phase. And you may find with your comb broom handle solution that, uh, oh, hey, you know, the comb teeth are actually facing down. And so it's a really bad back scratcher. It's more like a back poker. That's cool. You experimented. You found that perhaps you found steps towards the solution, but you didn't find the exact solution. Um, so you're like, thank you friends, family, whoever you observed, or you, you, you um, brought through this little, uh, little backscratcher experiment. And you go back into the design phase, and you start creating a better backscratcher. So maybe you turn those, um, those comb teeth to, the, to a 90 degree angle so that people can scratch better. And then you go back into the validation with a new prototype, and you do it again. And so a lot of people in a good design process will kind of bounce between design and validation as they come up with new ideas, and then they refine their ideas. And then finally, once they've validated it to a point where they feel like users, customers, 
whoever they're making something for um, is going to be happy with it, then they move into the develop phase. And that's where you actually build the thing. In the case of my back scratcher, this would be the time that you might start talking to manufacturers. But probably in uh, the class that we're talking about, this is the more apropos of the time that you actually design the screens or you code the application that you're doing. Now, the interesting thing about this user-centered design is that it's actually a circle. So the idea is, is that even when you create something and you release it to your friends, your family, or you sell it, or you give it away, or whatever the case you may be doing, your job isn't over. That actually it's just begun. That at that point, you should go observe users using your new product, your new thing, and see where you can start refining it, iterating on it, and making it better. And that starts a new cycle of the exact same process. Now with your new thing, you're watching people use it, in the case of the back scratcher, and you realize, hey, maybe I made the handle too long. That starts a new define process, and then a new design process, and on and on and on. And that's actually kind of the joy of, at least that's what I find the joy of design, is that it kind of never ends. You know, you make something and you, you release it to the public, and you're happy with where you're at, but you shouldn't really necessarily be satisfied in the sense that there always can be something that you can do better. And in the technology world, when you code, when you program, um, there's always the opportunity to, to improve right away after you've, um, after you've released something. That's what I find super cool. Here's just another example of user-centered design. This is from Nielsen Norman, who I talked about before. Um, instead of five phases, they use six phases, but it's more or less the same thing. They have a discover phase, which they call em empathize. Excuse me. Um, they have a define phase, which they call define. They have a design phase, which they call ideate. And then a, a prototype and test phase, which is essentially that validation phase that I talked about, and then an implement, implement phase, which is a build. And so when you look at user design processes or you go to another class and somebody says, oh, yeah, user center design is six steps, not five, or whatever, it's really because they're stretching out different phases of the original five or they're combining them together. So even though user-centered design is a, is a cycle uh, or a circle, excuse me, I'm going to go through some of the details of each phase as a straight line. And the reason I'm doing this is just simply because it's easier to represent on slides. Um, but you can think of when you get to the end of it, you know, over the far right, you just start over again. Uh, as I said, the first phase is discover. And there are a number of actions you can take within the discover phase to help uh, record and understand and observe users. Um, this is the time that you do things that are called, like user res are called user research or stakeholder interviews. What is a stakeholder? A stakeholder is just someone who is coming up with the basic concept, uh, who's coming up with the basic concept of uh, whatever idea. So again, back to my back scratcher idea, um, the stakeholder is the person that came up with the idea. You know, hey, we need to find out a better way for people to scratch their backs. Um, that might be you, <laughs> you know, it doesn't have to be someone else. But you should, um, you should always understand who the stakeholder may be because you should talk to that person, even if it's yourself, to talk about exactly what their, what goals and what objectives that person is having, you know. just. I really emphasize the thought that you have to talk to these people, or especially to the stakeholder, even if it's yourself, you can have an imaginary conversation with yourself, you can get yourself into a room, close the door so no one thinks you're crazy, and you can actually interview yourself, more or less, to do these stakeholder interviews. Um, and the reason that I like the talking method is just simply because the way it, it brings out the assumptions. If you don't talk these things through, if you don't talk out people's goals, even if it's your own goals, you don't talk out people's objectives, then there's too much left unspoken. There's too much left to chance. If you had a friend and that friend was the one that said, hey, you know, we're going to make the, the super cool back scratcher, and you were like, hey, I've got the skills to do it, you know, you can't just 
at that moment in time, you could run away and just start building things, but probably the better thing to do is to turn to that stakeholder and ask the very simple questions. These questions are very um, journalistic oriented, the same types of questions that you would ask, a reporter would ask a subject. What do you mean by a back scratcher? Where would someone use this back scratcher? What would be a successful back scratcher? Can you describe this? Those are questions that you need to ask the stakeholder, even if they're there yourself. But once you have those down, then it's time to turn to the users of this back scratcher in terms of user research. This is the moment that you would start finding people. They can be, um, ideally they're people, let me, uh, let me clarify, ideally they're people that would use this product that you're going to make. And that might not necessarily be the people that you know. But sometimes all that are the people that are around you are people that you know. So whoever these people are, they are considered your potential users. And more or less what you want to do is get them in a situation where they are going to use or where they have the opportunity to use what you might want to make or, or they give you the opportunity to find out what they're doing minus the product that you are going to make. So again, back to your my itchy batch, itchy back scenario, um, someone who, you know, if you're looking to make a better back scratcher, the best thing to do is find a bunch of people and um, ask them how they scratch their back or have, ask them to show you how they scratch their back. You might, without doing this thing, you might be sitting alone in your room and you might be like, hey, you know, I know how people scratch their back. It's really easy. They just reach around and, you know, they, they don't get all the spots and then they're unhappy and that's why I'm making a better back scratcher, right? But when you start asking people that aren't yourself, more or less, or, or finding people um, and observing them, you might find that everybody has a different solution. There might be some people that are like, oh yeah, I can't reach back here, so I'm gonna go to a corner and I'm gonna itch my back or I'm gonna squirm my back. Or you might find some other people that are like, listen, I'm just so depressed that I can't get to the right itchy spot that I cry. Or you might find people that are like, oh, I help other people. Or I have other people that help me scratch my back because I can do that. And those are all other potential solutions that you want to record, write down, or film um, so that you can reference them, because that's what real life is. Maybe a more um, practical example, one that's more familiar for everyone's lives. So I know I'm using the back scratcher because it's a very simple example, but there's a lot of a lot of people out there, probably a lot of you on this call, that use Instagram. Instagram is essentially a way to connect with people and share photographs, right? So. If you, were if you were designing in a world before Instagram, you, the problem might be, you might be, the stakeholder might say, you know, I see all these people sharing photographs, but it's not very easy to do. How can I make it easy? And then they would go find people sharing photographs and they would observe them or ask them, how do you share photographs with your loved ones, how do you share photographs with your friends or your parents. You would record down all the ways they do it. Oh, I mail them. Oh, I use Facebook, but Facebook isn't that easy because there's a million things going on with Facebook, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's the idea behind user research, is that you ask and you observe and then you record. Best is to find people that aren't necessarily you <laughs> or people you know. And, um, and yeah, that comes up, becomes your, the user data pool that will form essentially the solution to, uh, to what you're trying to do. Before I go on to the next phase, I just want to talk one more thing about users. I'm a little obsessed about users. You probably probably already noticed that. It's probably like, God, why does this guy keep talking about users? But um, the reason is, is because there's this concept called bias. Um, in, in the case of design, it's called user bias. And basically what it is, is that what user bias is, is when you replace yourself and how you think about the world or about design or about applications, you place yourself in, into the place of users. So a user bias is essentially um, 
one where you, instead of going out and finding users that aren't yourself or, or um, you just say, well, I know what users do. Like I use Facebook and I don't think it works really well there. And so uh, I think an ideal user would do X, Y, and Z. So the problem with user bias is that you are a user of things. That is very true. But you're only one user of things. And the whole idea behind user research is to get out and beyond yourself to observe how other people use things. Once you've gotten, oops, work. Oh, I'm sorry, one thing, last thing. Oh, I can't go backwards. OK, that's cool. Um, when I talk about record user actions, this, this is, doesn't necessarily have to be high-tech uh, ways to do this. You can just observe people and write down. You can uh, write journals. You can, um, you can just say, I talked to user A, user B. You can, it, it doesn't really have to, you don't have to capture this in the biggest, most scientific way. If you want to, though, um, take it to the next level, and a more interesting way to do this is when you take your user observations and you write down that raw data, then you start compiling them into what, user, into what we call user personas. User personas, I'll give an example after the slide, user personas are basically a, a representative of the one representative of the many users that you saw. And so a user persona might be like, well, I went and observed college students doing X, Y, and Z. And so I'm going to create a persona that's going to stand in place of the number of, a large number of people that I observed. Um, the idea behind that is just our brains can't always remember what every single user is doing or all that. And so you start rolling them up into a representation. All right, enough about users. Uh, when you've got enough user data, you've done your stakeholder interviews, that kind of stuff, um, the next level is to go into the design, define phase. Excuse me. The define phase is where you start fleshing out what we call the user journey. And this is where UX really comes into play, where a user journey might not just be the interface that you're trying to create, but what people are doing before the interface, what people might do after the interface. And again, the user journeys are like a map. They don't have to be high tech. You can use paper and pencil. And like with the example of Instagram, it's like, oh, well, what are people doing before they use Instagram? Why would they ever go to Instagram? Well, most likely the thing that they're doing before Instagram is what? Taking a picture. So that is part of your user journey. Take a picture. Then the next is like, how do you get that into Instagram? And then the next after that is how do you post? And then how do you consume? That is the whole user journey. It's not just the interface that you're trying to create, but it's what's before, what happens before and sometimes what happens afterwards. I'll show an example of that too after this. Um, after you've mapped out a user journey where you're like, okay, in Instagram, someone's going to take a picture, and then they're going to get it into Instagram, they're going to add a filter maybe, maybe not, and then they're going to post it, and then they're going to wait for the, the hearts to roll in, and the likes to roll in. This is the time that you start taking that journey and start compressing it down to maybe a screen by screen. How exactly would someone get a photo from their camera into Instagram? How exactly would they tag a comment onto their photo? How exactly would they see their likes? Um, so you start creating these user flows. So it starts getting from big, like from you observed users doing some things to now I'm thinking about how I can fix that problem and how the user will walk through that problem. And now you're starting to think about flows, like how will the users get from screen A to screen B to screen C to screen D. At this time, you might also create um, a site map, like oh, what's, the, what's the whole application look like? And ultimately, at the end of the design phase, if you've got some rough screens and you've got a site map, you might create a, what we call a prototype. A prototype doesn't always have to be digital, but a lot of time it is. But a prototype is usually, not always, but it's what we call low fidelity um, representation of the screen flows. So if you have screen A, take a picture, screen B, tag that picture and write a comment, screen three, look at your likes, you might want to take design, just rough designs of those screens, and place them together. And then just 
tap through it and see if it feels good. You can go and find some users, test it out, see what's going on. And that really, when you start doing that, when you start testing out a prototype, however you make that prototype, um, is really what is called the, it moves you into the validation phase. And this is the area where someone can sometimes get into the validation phase and then they go back to the design phase and they go back to the validation phase, back and forth, back and forth. And the validation phase is where you take your prototype and you start um, finding users again. They don't always have to be the same users that you did in the same in the first phase, in the discover phase. Um, and you find those users and you start just uh, testing it out, seeing if your ideas actually hold water, if they solve the problem that you're trying to solve. In design school, there's this, in an art school too, there's this concept of what's called the critique. And basically what the critique is, so if you walk away from design, you just move into the art world, just for a second here. Um, the, um, the, the concept of a critique is um, the idea that, you say, you, you're a photographer and you take a photograph. And now you're wondering, does this photograph, do people like this photograph? Does it elicit responses? All sorts of stuff. Um, what, we, what you do in art school, what you do in design school, is you put it in front of other people, usually art students, for a critique. And the rules of the critique are that you cannot speak about your art. You cannot speak about what you created. It's all up to how people are observing this and what their opinions are. The same ideas can be transferred into val the validation phase, where if you've created a prototype, you've created a certain design, and you want to validate it, the most powerful way to validate it is just simply to give it to a user, and then you be quiet, and you just observe what's going on. That's the validation phase. After you've gone through rounds of validation, if you want to, um, if you feel confident that you're actually, you've got a hit here, you, it's something that people will actually use, you move into the final phase of the cycle, which is the develop phase. And this is where you build the pages. This is where you maybe design the pages to a to graphic design level. This is where you may code it, which is what um, you know this class is all about. And this is where you ship. So that's essentially the cycle of user-centered design. I have um, a number of examples of some of the things I talked about, user personas, prototypes, that kind of stuff. But I saw in a lot of the comments that people might want to take a break. So I'm going to just hand it over to Sanjay for just a second here to see if we want to hold on or if we want to power forward or take a break before we go. Yeah, let, let, let's, let's take a four-minute break and come back. Is that OK with everyone? Yeah, that's OK. OK, let's cool. do that real quick. Thanks. All right. Cool. I'll be back in uh, five minutes. All right. So, Four minutes. Charles, we generally shoot to finish around 7.15. We can go a little over yeah. if we need to, but we generally shoot for that. No problem. I think I'll be done, actually. Yeah, yeah. cool. Then, so. And then also some questions if folks have any. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, we're, we're actually, uh, for everyone who's listening, we're actually in the home stretch at this moment, so we're, we're, we're doing pretty good.
All right, let's hop back in. Cool. Um, thanks for everyone. Uh, thanks everyone for for uh, for being here again. Um, I hope you're getting something out of it. Uh, let me go forward here. Um, one second. There we go. So uh, yeah. So in the last half hour or so, um, or a little more, I talked about the design process, but I didn't really talk a lot about the tool, or I didn't give too many examples about the tools and the ways that you go about doing this. And so the next couple slides just simply talk, give you examples of the tools that a user-centered design person uh, uses, or excuse me, uh, yeah, UX designer uses. And then it goes all the way even deeper into more specific tools like what do you actually use to create this stuff, at least in a digital environment? So first, when I talked about user observation, or uh, I talked about creating personas, here's an example of a persona, um, or some examples of personas. Basically, what they're supposed to represent is if you have, if you're actually doing a lot of user observations, you might find similar traits or behaviors among different users. Um, and you want to somehow roll those up into a, a representative user. Um, so in this case, I'm not sure what this product was for. I just took this example um, out, but these are just exactly what um, identifiers and behaviors a certain type or a certain subsegment of the population may have in regards to the product that they're making. That's persona. An experience map, I talked about an experience map being when you come out of uh, user observations and persona creation, you might want to create an experience map of the whole experience before they get to whatever you're trying to make and afterwards, that kind of stuff. An example of an experience map is here. Uh, this one uh, was pretty interesting from a health organization about um, obesity, how people manage the obesity and uh, the, the factors that play into it. And what I think is most interesting about experience maps or what you'll find is that um, usually they have a lot of phases. Um, so in this case, it's like pre-diagnosis, diagnosis, diet, and then um, prescription treatment if necessary. So a lot of experience maps talk about the phases in which a user might experience or come in contact with the product that you um, when you get even more detailed after an experience map, you might want to take and make a user flow. A user flow starts incorporating wireframes, which are essentially an outline of the screens that you may be able to, you may be creating, and puts them into a flow chart, which is like a choose your own adventure novel. So um, essentially, if you're um, you're like, well, I'm creating uh, Instagram and maybe when they upload their, or when they connect to their, their camera, there might be an error. A flow is to capture those kind of things, the alternate uh, routes that someone may take, the settings, the errors, um, all sorts of stuff. And so they're usually represented like this, which is a collection of screens and little diamonds. These little diamonds are basically flow decisions. These are also used in, in other technology uh, areas to basically represent decision making. So um, in the case of this, you have a screen and they, they, click, they tap on a button on the bottom right and it triggers a, a um, decision flow. Is the form filled out or is the form not filled out? And then different screens pop up based on those decisions. So from the personas to user experience, to user flows, to sitemaps, Another tool where you might just want to be like, listen, I'm making this huge application, and I want to see where all my pages are, all the possibilities. That's called a sitemap. They aren't usually decision-based. They're just more kind of like a record of what you're trying to do. And then finally, when you've done all of that, uh, you can create prototypes. And I want to spend a minute just talking about prototypes for, for a second. Uh, one, type of pro one type of prototype is the one on the right which is more of what we call a high fidelity prototype, where you design screens, and then usually you take a program or you program it yourself to connect those screens together. So it's like um, 
it's like a dry rehearsal for the real application itself. Maybe the data isn't real time, maybe not all the choices are there, but it's a general idea. And when you, you can put it on a phone maybe or whatever you're trying to do, and you can tap through it and just kind of see how it feels. That's called a high fidelity prototype. But you don't always necessarily have to do a high fidelity prototype to get the information that you're trying to get. If you're trying to figure out like how people just feel going through it, or if they're confused, or if they're uh, if they kind of understand what's happening, you can create what's a what's called a low fidelity prototype or a paper prototype. An example of which, which is on the left, this one is a great um, low fidelity prototype because is, if you can see at the bottom of the photo, there's like the paper is coming outside of the frame, and I know I've done prototypes like this where um, you get someone around and they tap on something and you just pull out the paper <laughs> as if it's a different content and different stuff shows up. And it's just an idea to see if people understand what the heck you're trying to do, what you're trying to solve, or if it's too confusing for them. So prototypes, if you have the time and you have the effort and you have the desire, definitely make a high fidelity prototype but you don't necessarily have to. Low fidelity prototypes are also super useful when you're iterating quickly because you might just be like, oh, I don't have time to just keep creating these digital masterpieces that I might not necessarily build for the final product. I might just wanna just make some cutouts and get them in front of people. But really prototypes and everything you're doing is to try to get, in, get the, get things in front of the user. Either you're observing users or you're building for the user. And so I, I just want to just highlight in user-centered design, it's in the title, don't forget the user. In all these process, there are opportunities for the user to be involved. And you should, I'm not even, uh, I just put these little stamps randomly because I, I think it's very, uh, it's up to everyone's innovation and creativity to really figure out where in the process of designing something you can bring in the user you know if you're just creating something and uh you want to you know go find users every day make something small and put it from the user make something small the next day put it from the user put them together put them from the user you know you don't have to hold back and i encourage you not to So that brings me to kind of the, the last bit of the main talk, which is what are some of what are some of the common designer tools? Uh, and so these are probably the most pop, four most popular tools that a designer uses to design digital uh, interfaces: Photoshop, Illustrator, Sketch, and Figma. And um, Photoshop and Illustrator are perhaps tools that you're familiar with um, already. A lot of people use Photoshop just to manipulate pictures um, for whatever reasons. Um, Illustrator is another Adobe product that uh, deals not only with photos, but the layouts of things. Sketch is a um, application that's gotten very popular recently. Um, in the sense that it does a lot of what Illustrator does, but it has a more simple user interface. <laughs> um, and then if this was 2017, my talk about design tools would stop right there. Uh, but now in 2020, uh, there's a new um, design tool on the market, and that's called Figma. And Figma is a cloud-based, uh, it has a lot of the capabilities of Sketch and Illustrator, but it's cloud-based, so that means that more than one person can use it at the same time. For prototyping, there are three very popular tools um, in, the, in the market right now, uh, but there are others. This is not meant to be a definitive list. Uh, one is called Framer. Uh, it's very technical. It uses JavaScript, which is basically an offshoot of HTML or an augment, a different language, I'm sorry, not an offshoot, but a different language that complements HTML. It uses JavaScript to um, to get pretty down and dirty with a lot of prototypes, very detailed. It's a very cool tool. Um, Protopy uh, is a cloud-based version of a prototyping tool. And Principle is a very good tool, very simple to use. Unfortunately, it's only iOS, so it's only for iPads and iPhones. 
didn't have graphics for this one, but there are two websites that can really help you uh, find and use the uh, basic um, templates for design. So like if you were creating an application and it had a form, you don't have to just create a form out of scratch. There are actually nice templates for forms. Uh, those can be found if you're interested in Android. Um, if you're interested in Android, which is an operating system for phones, like Samsung phones, Motorola phones, Google phones, uh, you can go to material.io. If you're interested in Apple products, they have what's called the Human, Inter Human Interface Guidelines, or HIG. And you can go to the website, or you can type in the Google Apple HIG, and you can find um, a website that talks about and gives you a lot of recipes and templates for interfaces for the, that product, those products. So that really concludes the main line of what I was going to talk about. But I just want to spend a couple minutes talking about non-screen-based things. Um, like the last 10 years or more, we've really been, we, <laughs> we as society, we as human beings, have been uh, very obsessed with screens. You see people using their phones all the time. They're on iPads. They're on computers, but mostly phones. And um, so a lot of people think of user experience and user interface as screens. Screen, 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 screen. And that's cool because that's a lot of what it is. But nowadays, there are um, various products out there, uh, Alexa, uh, Google Home, uh, excuse me, Nest Hub, all sorts of stuff like that, um, that are um, te technological products that don't have a uh, screen like you think of on, this, on a phone. And so how do you design for that kind of stuff? And really, the, it boils down to the fact that the process that I talked about, the five-step process, pretty much stays the same. But sometimes your assumptions through that process will, will change dramatically. When you have a screen-based thing, like a phone, you have the ability to, to put a lot of information on it, and people can kind of understand it. They can grok it very quickly. But when you're designing for something that only has four lights, like the Google Home, you really have a very limited way to communicate. It's a voice or these four lights. And so you have to start thinking and observe, doing a different set of observations. When I was uh, part of uh, the design group that was designing the Google Home Mini, we looked a lot at how people use furniture. And the reason that for that is, is because the, the mini is kind of like furniture. It, you put it out on the coffee table, you talk to it there, that kind of stuff. So we started looking at old, fancy furniture. And we found that you know, when you think of how the, the interface of furniture, it's like doors, way all the way back to the beginning of my talk with Don Norman and the doors. There's only so many things that someone's going to understand about furniture. And we kind of came to the same, through observation, we kind of came to the same conclusion about lights. And so we have Google Home Mini, Google Home, they have the voice, but they also have lights on them. But you couldn't, com you couldn't use the lights for too much, just like you can't put a lot of controls on your chair. And so we came up with the idea of like just only having five basic families of communication. Something is happening, look here, you have this much progress, I hear you and I respond, and something happened. We couldn't get much more complicated than that because just like other furniture, people don't really want their furniture to be that complex. They really don't understand it. And so we kind of came to the same conclusions when designing the lights for Google Home. So really, we went through the same process, but we came up with different conclusions because we were looking at a different set of uh, context. We were looking at different contexts, different set of users, different set of user actions. And so with that and those hilarious gifts, I conclude my talk for tonight. So I want to. Uh, yeah, Sorry, go, ahead. No, go, go ahead, Charles. Finish. I just want to thank everyone. <laughs> Thanks for sitting and listening. And I hope you got something out of it. And uh, we have a little time. So, questions or comments? Or... Can you go back to that image of the home mini? Yeah. Just go back. I, I want to point out something interesting to you guys here. Um, this is when this thing was designed, right? Nothing like it existed on the market. Sure, there was Amazon's version of this thing. Yeah. But it looked radically different. The only thing that we knew was there was a ton of machine learning and 
you know, search query capability that Google had, uh, there was this potential of connecting to a bunch of services, whether it was Spotify or whether it was, uh, you know, Google Play Music or whatever it was, right? And so there's this, this concepting or this kind of idea or, or design of, of hey, how, how should people interact with these devices, with these services, right? I think um, I think Charles kind of undersold it a little bit because he's a <laughs> modest guy, but but these guys get to design get they, they get to decide really, right? Um, what are the cues? What are the specific ways in which users get to interact with these types of these types of devices? For example, why aren't there more buttons on this? Why aren't there more lights on this? Right? Why are the lights in this pattern and not in some other pattern? Uh, I mean, Charles, maybe you want to elaborate a little bit on that. Like this is this user, user experience design. Is, it's not the study of this; it's the crafting of this. It's yeah. so fundamental. Yeah, I mean, one thing that we really wanted to do with the mini was um, we wanted what we noticed from Alexa and also from the original Google Home is that because people talk to it, they tend to put it further out into their house. It's not, in a, it's not always in a corner, but it's beside the couch, or it's on the coffee table, as I said, or some people put it underneath their TV. Um, but it's out in an area where, where if you had a guest over or whatever, people would actually notice it. Oh, what exactly is that? And so the essential idea, again, that kind of came from observations, observations from what we had seen before. And so we wanted to make sure that we're, whatever we created was something that was harmonious with your house. And so that's where fabric kind of came around, where it was like, OK, um, you know, let's, let's swath it in fabric so that it, it is like your couch or it is like your chair. But then from that point on, we also wanted to, you, what we observed is that people don't necessarily put things that are plastic or complicated in the middle of their rooms or in the middle of their living room or whatever. And so that constrained what we wanted to, what physical functionality we wanted to have on it. So we decided to hide the lights underneath the fabric. And we actually decided to have physical volume controls on it, but not necessarily make them like switches or knobs. And the idea behind that was that this is a voice first product. It's something that people are going to put in the middle of their room, but they may need just a little bit more than voice cues. So we came up with the idea of like the left to right lights because that is how people read um, is left to right, or at least in a large portion of, of, of the world it is, not everywhere. But it was, it was a good place to start. And um, we decided to keep it, uh, we do have some colors on the lights, but they're more or less white, again, because we observed that people aren't really going to stare at this thing. They're not going to pay attention to it and like really try and grok every little thing from it. So we wanted to keep it breezy, we wanted to keep it simple, and we wanted to make it harmonious. And these are all coming from ideas that we observed moving forward or coming from earlier versions of it or, or whatever. So it, it's, it was, um, I think everything that I've done on physical UX, on the lights and stuff like that has always been um, a very heated and lively discussion with the rest of the organization because there's always a desire to make things more functional, more, more, more. But, uh, and I think it takes real discipline to really ask the important questions. Like what will people understand? What will people want? What do people find desirable? And that takes a lot of constant and iterative observation. Good product. Uh, all right, what questions, guys? Charles, will you be sharing your slides with us? Yes. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. No problem. Yeah, there's a couple of links in there, so you'll have available these. Mm -hmm. They're all public. So you failed to mention Adobe XD among the tools. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I, it, that there are many prototyping tools out there, and a lot of them are very good. And um, the only reason that I, I uh, failed to mention XD is because it's um, I was just listing based on popularity and top of mind. and. Um, 
I've noticed that XD was a little bit late to the prototyping party, um, but that they've really caught up quickly. There's a, there's a very ease of use, especially if you have the Adobe products already. You may have access to XD without um, having to buy like another license, and th that one's that one's perfectly valid and a cool tool as well. All right. Anybody else? Any questions? Cool. If not, we will thank Charles for dropping in and uh, thank you, Mr. Charles. Us. Man, no problem. Anytime. Anytime. Thank you so much. <laughs> no problem. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Hey. All right. Thank, thank, thank you. you. All right, guys. You can all drop. I'll just. Uh, Thanks, Charles, again. You're welcome to stay, but I'm going to talk shop with Alex for a minute or two. Okay. okay. You know Thanks, I'm everyone. Gonna... I'll stop the recording now. Okay, cool. I'm going to okay. drop, but I'll, Alex, or actually, I'm sorry, Sanjay, I'll send you the slides in a 